this video is going to talk about embouchure and how do we get a good embouchure and what kind of what even entails a good embouchure in the first place. So this is one of those things that when we're learning to play the clarinet, our teachers tell us, okay, configure your lips and your tongue and everything in a certain way. And you know, it's like most of the time you're 10 years old and you have no idea what your body is doing. So you just got to stick the clarinet somewhere. It's like you made a sound, congratulations. So um, now I like to think about the embouchure from a couple different perspectives. And first of all, it's important to understand the purpose of the embouchure. The purpose of the embouchure is really to just provide a cushion for the reed to vibrate. And that cushion allows the reed to vibrate and produce the sound. If there's not enough cushion or no cushion, we don't get a sound. And what was going on in that, I gradually phased in a bit more pressure from the embouchure. And that's when we finally got that note to come out. So the embouchure overall, I like to think of it from two different angles and they're sort of contradictory, but they also complement each other. Uh, the embouchure should be firm enough or tight enough to control or focus the sound, while it should also be loose enough to allow flexibility and a resonance of the tone. If we have an embouchure that's too tight, we get a sound that it's really pinched and very forced. And you can actually kind of hear, I've got so much pressure going vertically that the corners of the embouchure are actually kind of peeling outward and getting that air leak. Whereas if we go too loose with the embouchure, not firm enough, we get a sound that's very spread and sort of tubby and unfocused. So we want to be right in the middle of those. Not something that's neither too tight nor too loose, kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, just right. So from a more physical perspective, I like to think about a triangle and Marcellus talked about this as well, Robert Marcellus, who, and if you don't know that name, definitely go look him up, principal clarinetist of the Cleveland Orchestra for many years and taught at Northwestern and the Cleveland Institute. And I remember being in high school and my teacher told me to listen to Mo Marcellus's recording of Mozart's clarinet concerto just until I sounded like that essentially because that was the sound. That was the sound and my teacher um, who had studied with Marcellus really believed in that and it's a it's beautiful playing. Go and listen to his Cleveland recordings with George Zell and his solo recordings of Mozart concerto and you can find radio copies of other chamber music as well. So go out and listen to Marcellus. But coming back to embouchure, Marcellus talked about a triangle and I, I envision that triangle as being the corners of the mouth and the chin. And Marcel says this is the formation he talked about. Basically the corners moving inward and the chin sort of being pulled down and flat. And that would give us the uh, best formation of the lips and, and allocation of pressure all around the mouthpiece. Not just this way up and down but from the entire um, from the entire lip system. I also like to think about the top lip coming down to basically remind myself not to bite up into the mouthpiece. You know, we talk about biting down a lot on the embouchure in the, or biting down on the mouthpiece with the embouchure. When we get that really tight or forced sound, but we're not biting down at all. It's really biting up because the jaw, the top teeth are do really doing anything. It's the, it's the bottom teeth and the jaw that's pressing up into the reed. And that's where we get that really constricted tone. So with our embouchure, we have the bottom lip should be curled up. Now we don't want to go all the way uh, where, where there's no red left anymore. There still should be a bit of the sort of colored part of the lip showing. <laughs> If, but if we go too far in, it really, again, sort of squeezes off the sound. And then you've got too much lip 
on the reed and it's not allowing the reed to vibrate. But if you go too far the other direction, we get the same issue. You have too much lip outward. <laughs> We again don't have the right formation. Uh, something that I always find really helpful is if you think about you were putting on um, like chapstick or lip balm, the amount of lip that you sort of roll in to apply a, a lip balm type product, that's how much you should be about how much you should be rolling in on the clarinet. About a third of the red should be showing if you're a fractions type of person. Now, moving to the top lip and the top teeth, the top teeth, assuming we're working with a single lip embouchure, which I do and a majority of American players do, the top teeth will actually be on the mouthpiece. Kind of that. When this top lip is just sort of a cushion. I like to think about this being tucked in toward the teeth as much as possible and then top lip down into the mouthpiece. Now, one important thing about top lip down, when we say down, when we're talking about down, it's more into the mouthpiece this way as opposed to moving down the mouthpiece in this direction. Sometimes that can be a point of confusion. So just to clarify, it's going sort of into the beak of the mouthpiece, so to speak. You might find the vibrations, the sympathetic sympathetic vibrations from the mouthpiece and reed uncomfortable. And if you do, I highly suggest getting a mouthpiece patch. And we can debate the merits of thin patches versus thick patches. You probably guessed I like a thinner patch myself. Maybe that's a good discussion for another day. But either way, a patch will sort of reduce those vibrations and won't make it feel like you're like it's kind of going into your skull as much. Now that's something that's really important with uh, young students as well. I've seen young students who are very sensitive those, to those vibrations and actually will curl into a double lip embouchure where the top lip is curled over as well to sort of avoid that sensation. And there's times where a double lip embouchure is very helpful and very useful. I use it myself as a sort of practice and teaching tool, but for, um, for everyday playing, I prefer single lip and that's what uh, most players, and at least here in the United States, prefer as well. The last point I wanted to talk about with this in terms of embouchure is where your lower lip should be contacting the reed. And there's a really easy way to deduce this. I'm going to hold this up. I don't even know if this is going to work. But if you can see the point where the reed and the mouthpiece separate from each other, where the mouthpiece curvature starts to curve away from the back of the reed, that's sort of the fulcrum. And that's where the reed is vibrating. So everything from about here up is what vibrates when we play. And that's where we want our lower lip to go. If we have too little reed or mouthpiece, we don't have enough reed vibrating. It gets really difficult to play the altissimo. But you don't want to go the other way either. If we have too much, got kind of that squawky sound. So it's all about both flexibility in terms of register and a beautiful sound. So to figure out exactly where that spot is, you can take a piece of paper. This is actually, I'm gonna use this. This is actually my notes from uh, recording <laughs> this video. So if you've ever wondered what the planning process for one of these looks like, it's this. Um, slide that gently between the reed and the mouthpiece. just to the point where it sort of stops on its own. So for me, that's right here. And I like that pencil mark is kind of a visual. You can do this with your students as well. Something else that's really effective, both for myself and my students, is I'll actually cut a piece of electrical tape and place it on that spot. Now it's gonna come off at a certain point, but you can at least get sort of the tactile or kinesthetic feeling of what that feels like to have that much mouthpiece in your mouth. All right, so I've got my tape, and now I'm gonna put that tape right on the pencil line that I drew earlier. 
And as I'm playing right now, I can feel that tape line and that's telling me where that reed should be contacting my lower lip. <laughs> So that's a really helpful thing. And you can play pretty much unimpeded with that piece of tape on the reed. So I highly suggest doing that, especially if you're sort of going through an embouchure, um, revisiting or reconstruction or otherwise revising how we approach the instrument. And I think the embouchure is really important because that is sort of the channel for our air to move through the clarinet. And it's the thing that makes the most immediate contact with the instrument. The other part of the embouchure that's super important, we've talked a lot about sort of the external side of things in this video, is the internal side. And I think of that more as the voicing, although the two ideas are definitely, definitely related to one another. So if you have questions on voicing, I highly suggest checking out the voicing video I did a couple weeks ago. But in short, keep the tongue up and sort of an eval and using really fast air is gonna help give us the best um, best success on the instrument and help us share our musical thoughts. Um, thanks for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave those on the comments here on YouTube or reach out on social media. Those links should appear here right about now, I think. And thanks for watching and feel free to share this and I hope these ideas are helpful to you.